family members, we're so glad that you're able to join us today. We're all delighted that your students have chosen UC Santa Cruz. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us tonight and everyone who's made this Zoom orientation session possible. Thank you, Andy, for the nice music. <laughs> and now, if we can go to the next slide, just a couple of words about logistics tonight. We're using Zoom webinar, which means you can see the panelists, but you cannot see each other and we cannot see you. For today's session, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. We will have some time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar and after each set of presenters. Questions will be sent to staff members who will field questions to the speakers. One speaker will be highlighted along with the presentation. To see the speaker more clearly, you can click and drag on the corner of the speaker's box to make the box bigger, if you like. Thank you, and next slide please, Andy. So I'd like to introduce to you tonight, Dr. Richard Huey, who was our Interim Vice Provost for the Division of Global Engagement, the Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education, and a Professor of Computer Science and Engineering, and of Biomolecular Engineering. Dr. Huey. Oh, thank you, Lisa, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us and for supporting your students as they are beginning their UC Santa Cruz education. Uh, your students, as you, have been learning many things about the university over the summer and are learning and many things during orientation. And I hope that you will help us encourage your students to make use of all the information they find out about and all the support that we have here at UC Santa Cruz for your students. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you our Chancellor Cindy LaRive, who joined UC Santa Cruz a little bit more than a year ago from UC Riverside down in the Los Angeles area. At UC Riverside, she was Provost of the campus, and before that, she was a Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Education, as well as the Dean of Physical Sciences. She's a Professor of Chemistry here as well. She's a wonderful person to work with and always has in the forefront her, of her mind the success of our students. So, Cindy. Thank, thank you, Richard, and, and so great to see everybody here today and so glad to welcome our parents, families, guardians, and friends. We're so excited to have you join our Bananas slug community. Please know that your children are in good hands. I'd like to share with you some things about what is now your university. UC Santa Cruz is a dynamic place. We provide the opportunities of a major research university with all the benefits associated with a small private school. Our college system is perfect for international students. The colleges function as small communities, allowing students to make friends and emerge as leaders. Our faculty and staff are working hard to make sure that students feel this community, even though we're do, build, building community remotely right now, and that your students have the resources they need to be successful. Our global mentorship program matches new international students with international upperclassmen so that young students always have someone to turn to if they have questions. Our peer navigators program is new and we're very excited about it. Each of our 10 colleges has established online mentorship programs around the college's core course. And we've made our peer academic success coaches available online too. We'll be holding online community building events throughout the year to connect international students. And we're working on making some classes asynchronous to help students who are living in different time zones. While instruction is remote for now, that's temporary. And when we do come together, our international student and scholar services team 
will be there to help should any immigration issues or bureaucratic tangles arise. They're also available now to answer your questions. So what else makes UC Santa Cruz special? We are home to excellent teaching. Our faculty is filled with pioneers in their fields. This year, we welcomed our first Nobel laureate, Professor Carol Greider, who received the 2009 prize in medicine and physiology for her work on the development of an understanding of telomeres. She recently joined our Department of Molecular, Cell, and Developmental Biology. Our astronomy, marine biology, genomics, and bioinformatics departments are world-class, as are our computer gaming, economics, politics, computer science, and engineering programs. I could go on and on. Students have access to outstanding research opportunities at UC Santa Cruz, and about 70% of our undergraduate students conduct research. That kind of opportunity is only available to graduate students at many campuses. I'd also like to share with you the many ways that international students enrich us here at UC Santa Cruz. Technology and transportation advancers have shrunk our world. Businesses and universities now operate at a global scale. And at UC Santa Cruz, we're nurturing global citizens and your children help us do just that. All of our backgrounds, life experiences and perspectives are unique and important. These differences are crucial at a university that celebrates diversity and multiculturalism and international students help us build cultural bridges. We need students and the world needs students who see the world through a different lens. Alternative perspectives are vital in all fields of knowledge and research. They help us see problems in new ways and breakthroughs and knowledge creation are the end result. I'm so delighted that you have entrusted us with your children our staff and faculty are committed to your children's success, and I believe there's no better place to launch them into the world. We have amazing faculty and instructors who provide students with deep insights and unique perspectives on the course material they will work to master. This is not an easy time for students to be starting on their journeys in higher education, but I am convinced that our students will come out of this stronger and more resilient. So welcome to the Banana Slug family. I so look forward to meeting you in person. Thank you so much, Chancellor Larive and Dr. Huey. And Andy, may I have the next slide, please? All right, I'd like to take just a moment to talk with you briefly about the Division of Global Engagement, which is in four parts. My team plans and facilitates orientations, events, and programs, and it's called Global Programming. We're joined tonight by our colleagues in International Student and Scholar Services, who advise and support your students with immigration issues and general concerns that your students may have as international students. There are two other teams in Global Engagement. One is our Study Abroad team, which your students may work with in the future to study abroad beyond the US. And the last is Global Initiatives, which works on agreements between partner universities and special programs. Thank you, Andy. Next slide, please. My name is Lisa Swaim, and my title is Director of Global Programming. And I'm joined by my two amazing teammates, Victoria and Andy, who will introduce themselves and then will present some of the following slides. Victoria. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Victoria Hudak and I am one of the Global Programming Coordinators here in the Division of Global Engagement with the Global Programming Team. Um, I work with a lot of essentially co-curricular programs that are available for international and domestic students, which I think we'll be talking more of as we explain what we do. But yeah, I'm glad everyone is here tonight and has been able to successfully log in. And I hope you learn a lot from this presentation. Okay, Andy, you're next. All right, thanks, Victoria. Hi, hello, everybody. My name is Andy Ng. I use he, him, his as my preferred pronouns. And I'm the other Global Programming Coordinator 
here within the Division of Global Engagement. Just like Victoria and Lisa mentioned, we are so very excited to see all of you here today to join us in celebrating what is the beginning of a huge accomplishment for not only your students, but for you all as family members as well. So welcome, and we're excited to see where this takes us. Thank you, Andy. And can we have the next slide, please? All right, and now we'll have a brief comment from Frank Calabrese, who is our Director in International Student and Scholar Services, and then a bit more from Frank and his team later in the presentation. Frank. Hi, everybody, um, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, as Lisa, she just introduced me, I am Frank Calabrese, and I am the Director of International Student and Scholar Services. And on behalf of the Division of Global Engagement, it's really my great pleasure to welcome you as the family of our incoming students into the family of UC Santa Cruz. I'm very glad that you're all able to join us because we understand that, that this is really a big step for, for you as well as for your incoming students. It's really important to us. We really value the, the diversity that the students bring in experience and perspective. Um, the international students bring so much to the campus. And I look forward to getting to know the exceptional young people that you've raised over the next few years. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about ISSS uh, later on in the presentation. For now, I am joined by two of my colleagues from the ISSS team, and I will just let them introduce themselves. Adrian. Hi, good day. Good evening, depending on where you're at. My name is Adrian Bergenfeld. I'm the Assistant Director of International Student Services. So your students will spend a lot of time with myself and then the other student scholar advisors that are with us. We're very excited to welcome you and your students this year, even though it's a non-traditional kind of year, but we still have a lot of exciting things planned and we're here to support your students every day as much as we can. Thank you. Thanks, and Gabby? Hi, I'm Gabi Schmiga. I'm the Assistant Director for Sponsored Student Programs. So I work with students that receive a um, scholarship from their home country government, an international organization, or um, the U.S. government. And so I make sure that their transition to campus and the billing goes smoothly. Um, a long time ago, when I was young, I um, actually was an international student and um, I remember quite well how it felt to come to the US and um, embark on this great adventure and how my mom felt um, about letting me go. So please know that we're all here, my colleagues in ISSS and also all of our colleagues on campus, we're here to take great care of your students and we're very much looking forward to welcoming them in person once we get the opportunity to do that. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Gabby. And I think Lena is out there as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Lena Lee. I am the office manager for the Bishop Global Engagement. Um, if you ever have questions and were to send us email, I am the first point of contact and I'll connect you with one of uh, my colleagues in the Division of Global Engagement. Thanks, Lena. So those are just a few members of the team from International Student and Scholar Services, and we will be happy to talk a little bit more later in the presentation and to answer any other questions that might come up. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much, Frank and team. It's great to hear from all of you. And I just wanted to let family members know that everyone in global engagement has spent a substantial period of time outside of our home country. So we all have had experiences similar to your students' experiences. I'm also the parent of an 18 year old, so I'm right there with you this year. <laughs> All right, next we turn things over to uh, Alan Christie, who is our Cowell College Provost and Chair of the Provost Council and Associate Professor of History, and Danielle Mello, Associate Director of Academic Advising. Alan and Danielle. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm Alan Christie. Am I visible, Lisa? Okay. You are uh, depending on our settings. Yes, you are visible. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Alan Christie. I'm a professor in the history department and I specialize in Japanese and East Asian history. As Lisa said, I've actually uh, lived abroad for a long time, eight years in Japan. Um, so I also went abroad as a young 
uh, uh, person as a college student. So I know what this is like for you all. Um, so I'm the provost at Cal College, the first of the residential colleges that were established here. And Danielle, would you like to say hello? Sure, I'm Danielle Mello. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Associate Director for Academic Advising. Great. So why don't we have the next slide, please? So I'd like to give a quick introduction to what the colleges are, because they were the sort of founding cells of the UC Santa Cruz campus. When the campus was founded in 1965, that founding generation wanted to create uh, small community units that would be both uh, places where students lived and studied so that they would be able to study in community, know their faculty members well, know each other well. They were doing this because they felt that higher education at that time uh, in the United States was becoming bigger and more anonymous. Uh, and so they felt that if they created these college systems with classes that the students would know each other and the faculty really well in, they could create a different kind of educational atmosphere. And so the colleges are at the very heart of the founding ideal of UC Santa Cruz. And I'm really very proud to be uh, the provost of the very first college that was established here in 1965. Um, the colleges are actually run in two parts. So I, as the provost, run the academic mission of the college, which means that I manage a curriculum beginning with a core course that all of your students are taking uh, in this fall quarter. Uh, but we also offer lots of other courses that are the kinds of courses that help a person become more rounded and don't fit necessarily into any one of the disciplines that exist. So for example, we have classes at Cal on public speaking, on personal finance, which is an, a perennial favorite amongst parents particularly, uh, and uh, model UN and mock trial and other things like that. Um, I also provide research support for students. So I, I have research funds that I can help stu fund student research projects. I often give them to scientists in particular. Um, and uh, I manage academic integrity questions. So if a student uh, has been, uh, has, has cheated or has plagiarized in, in a class, uh, that student uh, comes to me and we talk about what happened and we determine an appropriate sanction. Hopefully that, that doesn't happen. But if it does happen, my job is to make sure that the student is able to repair and be able to graduate successfully. That's always my goal in that. And then the one other thing that I'll mention about the colleges from my perspective is that the colleges are the heart of the alumni network. So all of the alumni who have graduated from the university since 1965 have their strongest connection to UCSC through their colleges. And so one of the really important values that a student gets from graduating from any university is contact not just with the professors and other students during their time there, but with the generations of students who've come before them. They have a, a global network, a national network in the United States and a global network when they graduate. And that global network is often channeled through the colleges. So one of the other things that I do is I really facilitate interaction between the alumni and the current students. Another side of the colleges is the residential life side, and that is headed by a senior director and uh, they manage the housing programs, the, the dining, other kinds of uh, extracurricular programming and student conduct. So if you have a question about the colleges and it has to do with housing situations, then you'll want to look in, in the college website for the name of the senior director and contact that person. And if, uh, if you have a question about academic things, you contact me. And if you contact me about housing questions, I'm going to pass the message along to the SD. So, that's a quick introduction to the colleges. Danielle? All right, we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Alan. So like Alan was mentioning, you know, one of the main facets of the college that's unique and each college has is, is the academic advising. So I wanna talk a little bit about academic advising at UCSC. In line with the teaching and learning mission of the institution, academic advising is a teaching and learning activity with a series of learning objectives associated with it. So we've organized those learning objectives in a way that lines up with the milestones that students are trying to meet to gauge their progress as they move through the institution. Academic advisors are available to support students as they develop their educational goals and they think about what kinds of plans they need to establish to reach those goals. Academic advising typically breaks down in interactions into three primary categories and that's relational, informational, and conceptual. So we work with students really holistically. We think about them as humans and think about their development and provide information about requirements and deadlines. Um, in a conceptual fashion, we work with them on learning how to incorporate enrichment opportunities into their academic plan, not just classes. And in a relational fashion, by helping them learn how to become self-directed learners and make sound decisions. 
Um, so that's kind of a, a quick overview of sort of what academic advising is all about at UCSC. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, at UCSC, students have a number of advisors, counselors, student affairs professionals that provide support in various functions for various purposes. All of them have their own individual areas of expertise, and all of them are important in supporting students as they move through the institution. So today I'm talking a little bit more specifically about academic advising. So those who are positioned to assist students in making academic progress towards earning their degree. Um, students have both a college advisor and a department advisor. College academic advisors are housed in the residential colleges and considered generalists. So they know a little bit about a number of subjects and specifically they focus on orienting students to the university, exploring, choosing, qualifying for a major, tracking academic progress. Uh, we track academic success. So if a student is in academic difficulty that falls within the college and we oversee general education and university requirements and sort of big picture academic planning. So they're kind of like a student's home base. Department advisors are housed in the academic divisions and departments and they're really specialists in a major or minor and focus on working with students, understanding the detailed nature of the major, the sequential course planning, course requirements, um, and any special opportunities in the major and connecting with faculty in the major. So while academic advisors are gonna be really helpful in working with students um, and figuring out their goals and their academic plans, it's very important that students are in touch with their advisors and support from international student and scholar services. Um, and I know you've heard from them already, you're gonna hear from them again, but we sort of work together in a nice little triad where the academic advisors are kind of experts in their area, but we are not experts on issues relative to uh, immigration status and compliance. And so we really rely on our partners at ISSS to help us make sure students get what they need in that area. Um, so if a student is ever not clear about where to go first, they can always start with their college and we'll get them where they need to go after that. Next slide. So as uh, Danielle was saying, the colleges help with advising that is going to be broadly oriented toward the student's career in the university, both coming in and graduating. Uh, and of course, everybody thinks about university in terms of the majors. I was a history major. I'm a historian uh, now. Um, our chancellor is a chemist, so that she would be in the chemistry major. Uh, but one of the other important things to understand about the university education is that the faculty have all agreed that in addition to the to the special knowledge, specialized knowledge and expertise that students are going to be gaining uh, in their majors, we think for a well-rounded education, there are a number of other classes outside the major that they need to take. And so these come in the form of the general education requirements. So as your student is choosing a major, the major advisors, the, the, the advisors in that department that runs the major are going to be helping them to navigate through that major, make sure they are fulfilling all the requirements uh, and meeting all the deadlines. But the general education requirements remain there for the students to also have to uh, take care of so that when they graduate, they have not only the specific, but also the broad and the colleges make help the students keep track of those general education requirements. So the faculty agreed uh, on what those uh, what that route well rounded education is and they established a series, a set of themes that they feel students need to have at least one class in uh, in order to be able to graduate and classes throughout the university have uh, a designation in the general education code. So a student might be a computer science major, but they might choose to take uh, a history class with me and cover a cross cultural analysis. Uh, general education for uh, requirement, for example. So as you can see in this list here, we have things like cross-cultural analysis. That means comparing, you know, one culture to another, being able to understand how cultures differ or are also similar. Ethnicity and race, interpreting arts and media, mathematics and formal reasoning. One of the things about that is you can fulfill that in a math class, but you can fulfill it in a linguistics class because linguistics are also about language systems. There's uh, scientific inquiry, statistical reasoning, textual analysis, and then there are a series of classes that have to do with perspectives, uh, whether uh, in, in environment and technology or human behavior, and then a series of requirements around practices in which students are going to be taking classes in which they're going to be especially developing skills in things like teamwork, collaboration, and public service. And then finally, there's a writing requirement that every student has to, has to pass as well. So again, the colleges are really helping the student navigate all of that stuff. The college advisors will help them pick those courses 
And then I, as a provost, always love to talk with the students about the things that they're thinking about taking. It's one of the great pleasures of being provost. I love being a historian, but when I'm provost, I talk much more broadly with the students about everything on campus. Uh, Danielle, let's go to you next. All right, we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about considerations for choosing courses at UCSC. Um, your student has received quite a bit of information about enrollment and they should have at this point, hopefully, already enrolled in their courses for fall quarter. Um, some of the things we like students to consider when choosing courses, especially in their first few quarters as they get situated, is a willingness to explore and take a variety of subjects where possible. Alan's pointing to some really good opportunities to do that in our general education framework. And consider more than just one major in case their first major doesn't end up working out. Many students change their initial academic plan, and that's okay. Um, it's common to be undecided. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And it also, people learn that they have new interests and strengths in different areas that maybe they weren't thinking of initially. Um, and there's statistics out there showing that major changers have higher graduation rates. So it's not always a bad thing. Um, it's also very important that students take major qualification courses really seriously. There's a lot of policies around performance in these courses to gain entry to the major, certain GPAs in order to be eligible. Um, and so that's a super important piece. And some majors don't recommend students take their major qualification quarters and courses in the first term just because they're getting adjusted to college life. Whereas other majors such as those in engineering really need students to hit the ground running right away. Um, there's a wide range of support resources available to students as they kind of think about how to be successful in their courses, tutoring, counseling, who I think is going to speak later in the presentation, support groups, and this fall we have a new student resiliency series in fall to help build kind of community with the new class. Um, so we've shared a lot of information with your students already about these resources. We will continue to do that as we meet with them in our advising interactions. And we just strongly encourage students to reach out to advising anytime they need support or if they have any concerns about their academic performance and we'll guide them accordingly. Next slide. So Alan kind of touched on this already and I, won't, I don't want to duplicate too much. He also has a quick story at the end that kind of illustrates this, but a quick note about selecting a major at UCSC. All majors at UCSC teach very important transferable skills that are incredibly valuable in the workplace and in a postgraduate program. Things like critical thinking, analytical writing, communication skills, presentation skills, problem solving leadership, all those super important things are really uh, encompassed in all of our majors. In the majority of cases, a major is not necessarily directly tied to what kind of job somebody might get or be qualified for. A student's activities outside the classroom are very important as well. Things like internships, field study, research to be a well-rounded, educated human. Um, Alan is gonna provide an example. Uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and say, um, oh, no, I have the next slide. And then Alan's gonna provide an example at the end. So we can go to the next slide. Um, just a few things. I know that sometimes students may not always share all their information that they need to with their parents and families. So I just want to get you up to speed on the information they've received so far relative to advising. They've taken two online courses that are heavily focused on advising and enrollment, preparing them for fall and preparing them to choose classes. A welcome letter from their college provost and introducing them to the provost and advising team. An opportunity to attend a group online orientation session in the summer follow-up from their advisors, we are, have been monitoring enrollment, and if we see any things we're concerned about with a student, if they're not enrolled in core course or enrolled in an upper division course, we've been reaching out to students to check in with them and ask them to change that. And next week, there'll be an opportunity for another online group advising session um, on Monday for most colleges. Um, if they wanna go and connect and meet and see their advising team, we'll also be mailing a hard copy academic advising folder with a couple of handouts and things that we'd like folks to review before fall starts. And just a final point, I, I said this a little bit already, but if a student is feeling lost or confused about where to go, or where to get started, they can always start by contacting their college first. That's what we're there for, to support the student. And if we can't answer their question and get them the information they need, we'll make sure we get them to the person who can. And information about academic advising, both drop-in and appointment is available on all of our websites. Um, so that's all I have to say to that. And I'll hand it over to Alan to wrap it up. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, I, I forgot to uh, expand a little bit on, on our chancellor's mention of a program called the Peer Navigators. And we are very excited about this new program here. We are uh, hiring students, uh, mostly who are in their second year, many who are international students or, or who are students from multilingual families here in the United States. 
um, to act as peer navigators for the core course. The core course is really important because it helps a student make a transition to the expectations and basic practices of higher education in the United States, critical reading skills, public discussion, uh, writing skills, uh, analysis, metacognition, thinking about thinking and whatnot. And so sometimes it's a particularly difficult transition to that kind of educational system. And, uh, and so we have students who were successful in the past years and who made the same transition that your students are making now, who will be accessible to your students to talk to any time to get any kind of advice about how to meet expectations and talk to the professors or talk to the other students and whatnot. So mentors are the people who have gone through the same path that your students have gone through and they're available for you, uh, for your students now. So uh, in this coming week, your students are going to have their first plenary session with me, that means, and all the other provosts, which means they're going to get together in that core course for the very first time, and they're going to meet our, their provost. And when I talk to my students, I ask them to think about what the purpose of their higher education is. And of course, we all understand credentials. You're getting a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts, that's really important uh, to being able to establish your ability to get a job. We also think in terms of the majors often helping people establish that they have the skills necessary for jobs. But I also challenge them to think about their education overall and how the education that they are going to be getting here that's more broad has an important role to play in their future careers and their future prospects. So the story I'll tell is about a time I was at a gala. Yes, I've been to a gala. It was kind of exciting. And I was sitting at a table with the guest of honor and I was sitting opposite the table from her next to a human resources executive at Apple. And I'd never had a conversation with the human resources executive before. So I said to him, I'm a historian and sometimes parents worry about their, their children being history managers and not being able to get jobs. And yet we often read uh, articles in Forbes and Business Week about uh, Silicon Valley CEOs who say we need to hire more humanities majors. So I said to the HR executive, is this true? The CEO doesn't hire, you hire. So tell me, how would a, a humanist be a viable candidate for a job? Or what would any student, what would you be looking for in any student? So he said, you should understand that all the training that students get in college is great, but to work in the specific atmosphere of whatever company they come to work for, they're gonna to need to be trained and that's an expensive process. And so the company wants to hire people and hold on to them for a long time because that's how they get the value from the, from the, uh, from the employee. So he says, the way that you can tell if a student is, if, a, a, if an employee is going to be able to stay with the company is whether or not they're gonna be able to move laterally. They might come in in the research department and we might put them in the marketing department and we might put them in uh, a human resources department, et cetera. And if they can adapt from one site to another, they're going to gain mastery over the entire company. And people who have mastery experience in different parts of the company are the people who rise up in the company. And the picture he described for me was like this Christmas tree here in this picture. You start off and you can move broadly and then you're gonna move up and to the top of the company. So he says, the key thing is that they have adaptability, that they know how to learn and they know what it takes to learn. And that's why you wanna have that combination of the major and the general education requirements. Inside your major, a student's gonna feel pretty comfortable after a while because they know what the learning's about. When they step outside of the major and they're having to learn in a different discipline, they're going to be learning important skills about adaptability. And so that's what students are needing. They need both skills and adaptability. And in the end, imagine you're a student as a computer science major going for a job against 1500 other computer science majors, that your student needs something to make him or her be distinctive. And that distinctiveness is gonna come, as Danielle was saying, from the extracurricular activities and the other classes they've taken. And so that's why it's really important that your student uh, not just focus on their major, but they, they look at their broader life. That will make them more employable and uh, more adaptable for a long-term successful career, which I know is very important to all of you. So thank you for your time. I, I'm, I love working with Danielle. The colleges are a, a wonderful thing at the, at the university. I'm so glad that you all are going to send your students to be with us. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Alan. Families, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the Q&A function at the bottom. And panelists, if you can field questions as they come in, if they pertain to your area, that would be very helpful. 
Thank you. And we'll transition now to our presenters from Campus Safety. So we have Lieutenant Mary Garcia and Chief Nader Ois with us today. Mary and Nader. Hi, everyone. My name is Nader Ois, and I'm the Chief of Police with UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I welcome you and your students to UC Santa Cruz. I know uh, this year is a little bit different, but once they get onto the campus, uh, we hope that they can come and meet us and uh, understand what resources we have to offer. Uh, we do have a short video that we want to show you, but before we do that, uh, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Mary Garcia. Hi everyone, I'm Lieutenant Mary Garcia. I've been with the UC system for about 17 years and I just joined UC Santa Cruz last September, so I've been here a year. I'm very happy to be at this campus. I love it here. Welcome to UC Santa Cruz. Andy, if you can go ahead with the video, thank you. My name is Nader Oase, and I'm the Chief of Police with the UC Santa Cruz Police Department, and I welcome you to UC Santa Cruz. The Police Department is here to be a resource for you and your family in case you need us. Don't be afraid to approach us, say hello, or even take one of our Community Academy classes, which is offered every quarter. This year, it's going to be offered online. In the event of emergency, students, staff, faculty, and visitors can call 911 using their cell phones, landlines, and blue light emergency phones that are located throughout campus. These blue light phones connect callers directly with our 911 dispatch center, which is located at the very base of the campus inside our police department. There are approximately 60 blue light phones located throughout campus. These are along pedestrian walkways, most bus stops, and in some of the large parking lots. Blue light phones are activated by pressing the large red button. A blue light beacon will shine to direct emergency personnel where to go. The emergency personnel will also get dispatched even if the caller can't speak on the line. Blue light phones are just another way to keep our campus safe. My name is Alexandra Santini. I am a public safety dispatcher here on campus at UCSC. And I'm one of the nine other voices that you would uh, listen to or hear from if you called into our dispatch center. And you can do that one of a variety of ways. If you called on your cell phone, on our non-emergency number, which is 831-459-2231, extension 1. Uh, if you called 911, if you dialed our maintenance line or one of our CSO lines. If you call in to dispatch, uh, there's a set of questions that we normally ask no matter what type of call. So it's uh, who's calling, where are you calling from, what are you calling about, and then depending on the type of situation, you're going to get you know, a varying degree of other questions, but the main focus is who, what, when, where, and why. And it's important for us that we ask those questions just so that we can make sure that you're safe and that whoever's going to be responding remains safe while doing so. It's uh, very important when you call in and that you remain a safe distance away from whatever emergency is occurring, if it's a crime or a fire, so be it, that you first take into consideration your own personal safety and the safety of those around you. But typically when you call into 911, we have an E911 map. So it's an electronic map that tries to use the coordinates of whatever phone you're calling from so we can get a better sense of where you are. This system isn't perfect. It could be a varying degree of just giving us a broad spectrum range over the county or a specific down to a couple feet of where you're standing. We're also working on technology that would allow you to text us directly through a 911 system. Keep yourself at a, at a distance that you feel comfortable with. Try to provide as much information as you can. We will make sure that we get the help that is necessary to you as quickly as possible. Here at UCSC, we're a full-service police department. We operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we handle calls all of those times. We work with all the campuses that are here in California, and we also work with local agencies. Here we commonly work with both the Sheriff's Office in Santa Cruz, as well as Santa Cruz Police Department, uh, California Highway Patrol, and any allied agencies. All the police officers are like 
counter at UCSC have statewide peace officer powers. What that means is that every police officer you encounter here on campus has the same authority as any other police officer. Say California Highway Patrol, uh, Deputy City Police. We are university police officers, but we all get the same training as any other law enforcement officer. So we go through the same type of training that a city police officer would go through. Here at UCSC, we handle everything from patrol, crime prevention, uh, investigation, as well as working with the general community. More information about crime, statistics, and resources can be found at police.ucsc.edu. The cruise alert system that we utilize here at UCSC, it's basically like a campus emergency alert system that'll send out like text messages or emails super quickly to students, staff, affiliates, anyone who is going to be on campus or is coming to campus or is leaving a campus. That way they have accurate, like real-time information coming from our police department. You can sign up, it's totally free at the UCSC website. Go to just type in Cruise Alert, you can search it. Uh, it's super easy to do so, and then you'll be signed up immediately, start getting alerts. The City of Santa Cruz Fire Department is located on campus on Chickenpin Road and McLaughlin Drive between Colleges 910 and Crown Merrill. You can find out more about the UCSC Police Department by going to our website. You can just go to police.ucsc.edu for more information. Don't forget to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, you can just look up UCSC Police Department and you'll find us. Congratulations and welcome to UCSC. If you, if you can put up the, uh, the slide with our information on how to contact us. I think it's the one before that. Yeah, I think it's right before that. Does anyone have questions either through the chat that we can go ahead and take on while we uh, get our contact information up? Or Lisa, was anything provided prior to the seminar? Uh, no, nothing came ahead of time. Um, there are some families who may watch this presentation later who may have questions. Um, and Andy, do we have that contact slide or I can potentially show it on my screen if, if needed? Yes, Lisa, my apologies. If you could show it on your screen, that'd be fantastic. Okay, <laughs> let me see. The important thing is we want our students and our community to sign up for the cruise alerts because it will get you timely information about emergency incidents on campus that you all need to be able to stay safe. We have a lot of information on our website. Uh, if you navigate our website, we have information about community events. Um, in fact, next Thursday we start our community academy and I've sent Lisa and Andy both the information on how to start getting information and register for a community academy in the last 10 weeks. You'll learn all about the UC Santa Cruz Police Department our role here, we'll have a lot of discussions about many topics involving policing. We'll talk about our policies, our practices, you'll get to meet some of our officers. And for students who take the Community uh, Police Academy, you get two units of school credit. So that's definitely a plus. And if you have any questions more on the Academy, you can contact one of us or you can go straight to our website. The other thing that you should know is, you know, we really are here for you and please use us as a resource. Uh, not only are we here uh, for your safety and the safety of the community, um, but we have a lot of, uh, a lot of our staff that have graduated from UC Santa Cruz and understand the campus and can also help you navigate um, even, you know, what classes you should take, et cetera. So please use us as a resource. Don't be afraid to call us. Uh, please go to our website at police.ucsc.edu. Uh, sign up for Cruise Alert at cruisealert.ucsc.edu. Um, and if you want to really know what also what's going on campus uh, and you want to get text messages or emails uh, about different types of crimes, uh, on our website, you can go to our crime graphics page uh, and set up and sign up for uh, daily emails uh, about things that may be happening on campus. Um, with that, um, if there are no questions, Lisa, we'll, we'll turn it all back to you. How's that? Okay. 
Thank you. I'm sorry the um, image is so tiny on my screen, but we'll go back to the main presentation now. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everyone. Welcome. Congrat and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Andy, are you able to share the main presentation again? I apologize. <laughs> I am, yes, give me one second. My apologies, everybody. It's a, a little technical difficulty here, but give me one second. All right, and as usual, families, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will attempt to answer them as we're able throughout the presentation and at the end of our, our time together. All right, and now we're joined by Anastasia. Anastasia Alexandrovskaya, who is an international case manager in the Student Health Center and in counseling and psychological services. Anastasia. Hi, welcome family. I'm so glad that you guys are here. My name is Anastasia and I am a case manager and psychotherapist and I work with the Student Health Center as well as with CAPS, which stands for Counseling and Psychological Services. So my specialty is working with international students. I speak English, Russian, which is my first language, and conversational Spanish, but once it gets into medical uh, terminology, I do use an interpreter. Next slide. So I just wanna go over a little bit about how I support your students and also what kind of services they can get on campus, both on the health center side and on the psychological side. So part of what I do is I assist students in navigating health services. So getting connected to off-campus care, understanding insurance, referrals, and everything that kind of comes with the medical system here. I also provide mental health services. I'm a licensed psychotherapist and I can support students with any of the stressors that come along with being a university student, but even more specifically so being an international student. I can also help with understanding academic options. Um, you heard a little bit before about advising. I can get students connected to advising and help them navigate some of the um, opportunities that they have with that. Um, and newly, as everything is changing, I also do a lot of COVID support and contact tracing, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're gonna keep your students safe here on campus. Next slide. So all of the information that I'm giving you is available at our website at the healthcenter.ucsc.edu. So if I go quickly, just know that you can access that information there at any time. So our health center is open. So we are seeing people in person for um, any symptoms that they're having, but we're also offering a lot of phone appointments. So things that we can do remotely, we're doing remotely right now. So we're open from 8.30 to 5. There is the number that students can call to make an appointment um, for same day care labs and radiology. And like I mentioned, we're doing a lot of phone appointments as well. So if it's something that can be assessed over the phone, we're happy to do that. There is also a link on our website for scheduling COVID testing, which we, for students on campus, it's gonna be a requirement to do so every week. We have self-directed SCI screenings, online birth control consultations, and we have a nurse advice line. So if your student isn't quite sure if they need to go in or what they need to do, they can always call the nurse advice line and get a little bit more information. Next screen. So this is this exact breakdown is available on the website, but it basically helps the students kind of understand who to contact and how to schedule depending on what kind of care they need. If it's something for same day, like an injury or an illness, like a cold, you can call and schedule an appointment. Routine appointments also like physicals, annual things that they need to do can be made um, appointments over the phone. For emergency services, we are not equipped to handle crisis life-threatening emergencies. So that is a situation where you would dial 911 in order to go to an emergency room. The nurse advice line that I mentioned earlier also works outside of business hours. So if a student is not feeling well outside of the you know, 8.30 to 5 p.m. time that we're available, they are able to call a nurse and get some feedback on what is the best way to keep themselves healthy and safe. There are also some appointments that you can schedule online, which includes the COVID testing that I mentioned earlier and some of the same day schedules as well. Next slide. So the other 
part of what I do besides the case management in the health center is that I work with CAPS, which is the Counseling and Psychological Services. So we offer a lot of different things. One of the main things we do is individual counseling services. And the best way to get connected to that is to call and set up an appointment for an IA, which is an initial assessment where a psychologist will speak to your student and see kind of what's going on and how we can support them best, whether that's on campus or getting them connected to somebody off campus. We also have brief drop-in informal meetings, which are called Just Talk, and the schedule for that will be on the CAPS website. And that's basically for someone that doesn't feel like they have enough to really bring to a counseling session, but they're, they're needing to talk to somebody that day, and they can definitely come in and do that. We also offer groups um, on how to manage anxiety, how to manage mood, grief support groups for people dealing with loss, mindfulness groups, all sorts of groups that are offered will be on the website as well for the fall quarter on what the availability is. Right now we're still doing things remotely, so these will be remote groups and hopefully we can get back to doing them live and in person soon. And the last service that psychiatry or that CAPS also has is psychiatry, which focuses on medication management. So students that are coming with uh, psychotropic medication from their home country, or if they're wanting to initiate medication here, they can also do that with our psychiatrists. Next slide. And then I wanna talk a little bit about insurance. So hopefully you know about the UC SHIP insurance, which is what our university offers. And it has really great coverage. Um, it's really comprehensive for students. As you can see on the list on the left, it kind of goes over all of the services that with UC SHIP are completely free on campus. So if your student has UC SHIP, they can come in for annual exams, physicals, in illness or injuries. If they're feeling sick, they come in, there's no copay for that. Um, immunizations, a lot of students I know from some countries are coming in with immunization requirements that they're not able to get in their home country. So getting those immunizations at the Student Health Center will be free for those students to make sure that they're in compliance. X-rays, dental cleanings, all of these things um, are, are free for students with UC SHIP. So as I mentioned, most on-site services are free besides certain things, maybe some lab work that we would have to send off of campus. Um, in order to see someone off campus, so for example, like a specialist for a dermatology referral, they would first need to speak to one of our providers and get what's called a referral to that provider. So I can help navigate that if that becomes confusing for students. Um, another thing to note is that your student is not going to get a physical card. It's all electronic and there's a student health app that we ask them to download where they can manage their insurance. Next slide. Um, and again, the reason I say that UC SHIP is really comprehensive and I really recommend it to all students that are going to be on campus um, and even off campus because we are able to provide their off campus providers that take our insurance as well. So for someone that's coming into the student health center, the person on the left in this diagram, they, you know, come in because they're feeling sick. At the end of the day, they pay $7.65 for that lab that got sent off campus. A person that's coming in with a different insurance is going to pay $206 just for being seen. That would be the copay for being seen at the student health center, as well as the lab costs, which would then be $329. Uh oh, Anastasia, we lost your sound. My internet connection is not doing great, so I'm not sure if I got lost for a minute there. I apologize. My we can hear you now, though. Thank okay. You. Okay, great. So hopefully that diagram is self-explanatory. I'm sorry if you lost me for a minute there. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we're gonna keep your students safe. I know this is a stressful time during a pandemic. So what we're doing right now is that we've set up kiosks that are gonna be around campus where students can schedule themselves to do a self swab. So they're actually gonna to go to one of these kiosks, they're gonna swab their nose and they're gonna hand it to the person that's there. And for students that are living on campus, we're actually asking them to do it in the beginning, it's gonna be once a week, but it's actually gonna go up to twice a week as I was informed today. So the idea is we're gonna be testing students as frequently as possible just to make sure that everybody is safe. Next slide. 
And again, to sign up for a test, you can just uh, access the website and go to the Healthy Messenger with the cruise ID and gold password. Your students will know exactly what that is because they need that to use that to basically access anything. And they can schedule the appointments and um, choose the date they want to get tested. And they'll get a reminder message two days in advance, as well as a text two hours in advance to remind them to go and get tested. Next slide. And just so you can know what we've been doing behind the scenes to make sure that it's going to be safe for students once they're coming onto campus is that if students do test positive for COVID, they will be moved to special units that we have prepared on campus that are specifically for isolation. They have a private room and a bathroom, so they're not going to be exposed to anybody else. And we actually have a system where food will be delivered to the room. They'll be able to order food and they'll be delivered to them there and they will isolate for 10 days from the onset of their symptoms. So from the first day they started feeling sick, they will stay in isolation for 10 days. And then students that have been in close contact with a positive case, so more than 15 minutes together with less than six feet apart, will need to self-quarantine for 14 days. If those students don't have access to a private room or bathroom, if they're living off campus in a setting where they have a lot of other housemates, we will also be able to move them to these locations to make sure that they don't expose anybody else to the virus. Next slide. I think we may have lost your sound again, Anastasia. Thank you so much. Oh, no, now I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, it was just my wrap up. I just wanted to say thank you and welcome. And I look forward to meeting your students when they get here. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, families, if you have any questions for Anastasia about health or counseling, please add that to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And we are going to transition now to a conversation about student business services and we have with us Victoria Lipscomb, who is a financial literacy coordinator. She's going to talk to you a little bit about paying your student's bill. Hi, welcome. My name is Victoria Lipscomb, and I'm the financial literacy coordinator in Student Business Services. Student Business Services handles your students' UC Santa Cruz bills. We are a different department than financial aid. The financial aid department calculates any aid offered to your student and packages their offer. We handle everything after that point. Today, I'm going to discuss your options on paying your students UC Santa Cruz bills. Students will receive a bill from UCSC every quarter, and they may also receive additional bills monthly. Quarterly bills include charges for tuition, on-campus housing, and registration fees. Any monthly bills would include payment plan charges if they're on a payment plan and miscellaneous charges for printing, library services, and other fees. The due date for payment is usually one month after the bill shows up on their student account. So if they receive a bill August 1st, for example, that bill must be paid by September 1st. The exact due date is always listed on the bill and it may not always be exactly one month out, so please be sure to pay attention to each individual due date. Students must sign you up as an other payer on their billing account for you to receive bill notifications and pay their bills for them. We have instructions on how to do this on our website at sbs.ucsc.edu. Once you are signed up as an other payer, you will receive an email whenever a bill is created on your student's account. You can see the full bill, including charges and due dates, and you will have a portal that you can use to pay. Next slide, please. We offer many ways to pay our school bills. This is a full list of our payment options, but there's a lot here, so I'm gonna break these down on the next couple of slides. Next slide, please. If you have a domestic bank account, you can pay a bill with a check, money order, or cashier's check from your bank. If your student is on campus, they can also pay with, our, with cash at our office in Han Student Services. If you have a 529 plan in the USA, you can pay a bill from the 529 plan by mail or through our online e-bill e-pay portal. There is a $10 fee to pay with a 529 plan through the online portal. Students with domestic bank accounts can also use the UCSE e-bill e-pay system to pay their bill directly from your bank account. There is a 95 cent fee to pay electronically with a domestic bank account through e-bill e-pay. Next slide, please. 
UCSU's eBill ePay portal takes Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express with a 4.25% fee for international cards. Flywire takes all debit and credit cards as well as electronic bank transfers from almost any bank around the world. Fees for Flywire can vary based on the exchange rate, but in general, there is a 2% fee on electronic bank transfers and a 4% fee on credit and debit card payments. Flywire can also do international wire transfers to UCSC. You can also use Western Union and MoneyGram to send money to UCSC for your student's bill, but there may be fees for these services. Next slide, please. Student Business Services recommends Flywire for your international payments. Flywire is the easiest and most likely the cheapest way to pay for your student's bill if you do not have a bank account with a USA financial institution. Flywire allows you to pay using your country's currency with competitive exchange rates. And it also is very secure and it allows you to track your payment to make sure it gets to UCSC correctly. There is a multilingual support available as well, especially if English isn't your first language. For students who may receive refunds, Flywire is a safe and easy way for UCSC to send refunds to students, even if they don't have a domestic bank account or if they've returned to your home country. While I'm on the topic of refunds, I wanted to make a quick note of our refund options if your student is expecting a refund. If your student has a domestic bank account, they can set up direct deposit within their student account. If you paid their bill with a credit card through our eBill ePay portal, we can refund directly to the credit card. If you, pay, if you paid through Flywire, we can authorize Flywire to refund through the original payment with just a student ID. Otherwise, we will send a check in the mail to your student. Most foreign banks do accept US checks, but not all do. If your student expects a refund, you may wanna double check on your payment options and whether or not your bank accepts US checks. That being said, even if your bank does accept US checks, sometimes it can take up to weeks for those checks to be able to be cashed. Using Flywire or paying with a credit card through our portal is probably the easiest way to ensure a quick refund process. Next slide, please. Now we have a few minutes for questions. Before I answer questions, I wanted to remind you of our website, sbs.ucsc.edu. We do have video tutorials on how to pay your bill, how to add an other payer, and other information that will be useful for you and your students. We also have our contact information listed. Due to the pandemic, our in-person office is currently closed, but we can still be reached by email and phone. We also are offering Zoom open office hours, and those hours are listed on our website. I also want to plug our financial literacy program, SlugSense. SlugSense has financial education resources and we offer workshops, online education, and other programming to help students learn how to be financially savvy. Thank you for listening. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Victoria. If there are questions yeah. for Victoria, please add them to the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop. Not sure where it is if you're on a phone, but it's there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. All right, Andy, next slide then. All right, and we wanted to say a couple more words to you from Global Engagement. Um, and again, we are two of four of the teams in Global Engagement, Global Programming and International Student Scholar Services. And so next slide, please. We will begin by talking just very briefly about Global Programming. Um, sorry, I lost my notes. <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to talk first about orientation programs. So we have had uh, several events this week for your students beginning on Tuesday evening, Tuesday evening our time, international student orientation. We've done some community building with global mentors in small groups, and we've done some small group games and activities, including, including a virtual tour of campus today for your students who are able to join. Uh, we will continue with programming and events through the year, and so I'm gonna pass things over to my colleagues to talk about the other aspects of programming. Yes, thank you, Lisa. So one of the things that we also do with our students, um, both domestic and international students, is that we celebrate International Education Week on campus. 
International Education Week is a joint venture by the U.S. Department of State and Department of Education as a way of promoting the international culture within a university setting and to help celebrate that diversity. So this event usually takes place in the month of November. And so this year will be a week long of many different events and workshops that celebrate that diversity on campus. Some of the events that we have planned this year include an international open mic night, where we have different cultures and different activities happening, uh, where folks can come in and join us live, I think on Instagram this year, and they'll be able to do performances, spoken word, poetry, just a really good way to celebrate the different levels of internationalization on our campus. We also do an international trivia night that has been very popular over the past few years. And we also have different workshops throughout the week as well for folks that are graduating and um, are looking to see what is beyond graduation, beyond OPT. We have a workshop for that. We also have a Chinese name pronunciation workshop as well. So we, as you can see, there's a variety of things that we offer for our students. And we also encourage our students to join us in celebrating International Education Week. So if this is something that you believe your student may be interested in joining us for, please encourage them to reach out to us because we would love to have their participation. And I'll pass it over to Victoria. Okay, thank you, Andy. And I I'm unmuted myself just in time. So some more of the events that and programs that we coordinate here at Global Programming. One of them, um, Cynthia Larive actually mentioned it at the beginning of our session today. One is the Global Mentorship Program. And the Global Mentors are upperclassmen. Most are international, but we actually have a few domestic students who are global peer mentors who are just really interested in helping international students get acquainted and transition to life at UC Santa Cruz. And they also did outreach to their mentees over the summer and they had community building activities last night our time. Many of your students showed up so we're really grateful for that to start making those connections. And other things that we have done are the Global Taste of Santa Cruz or we've done day trips to San Francisco or to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And looking forward, we're also going to be doing some online cultural events like carving a pumpkin for Halloween. We're gonna be having intercultural workshops, um, introduce students to US classroom culture. And we also are doing a series of global cafes, which is where we go online. You grab your favorite drink, it doesn't have to be coffee. And there's different cultural themes for discussion and dropping in. And so, as you mentioned, this is just like the wide array of the programs that we do here at Global Programming. Thank you. And then Frank and team, would you like to talk a little bit about International Student and Scholar Services? Sure. Um, hi, everyone, again. I just wanna say quickly, um, you've heard a lot tonight, so I don't wanna to take too much more of your time. I just wanna say that I know that of course you know this has been a strange year and no year of course is an easy time to send off your child off on their own or you know maybe for a lot of you it's not easy either to keep them at home an extra couple of months when you're ready to get rid of them and set them free um, really I, I i do want to take a minute to acknowledge that there are some things that i think might give you pause at the moment covid of course but we have plans for that um, fires and protests and divisional things that that might give you some hesitation. I just want to say that everything that we on campus have done or decided in the past six months has been with the safety of your students in mind. Um, and do my best if we can to reassure you that we're all here to offer support for your young adults through all of this and committing to shepherding them through their education and and beyond. So uh, a little bit about ISSS. You can see on the slides a little bit of what we offer. Um, primarily, of course, we are the immigration office, and uh, that means we take care of all of the visa and immigration and compliance issues that your student will face. Um, maybe you've been in touch with us already or one of our team um, in requesting an I-20 or asking advice about how to get a visa at the consulate. Um, these are all things that are very essential to what we do. Um, 
We also make sure that students are staying enrolled and maintaining all of the responsibilities involved with their F1 status. We work with them on employment authorizations, uh, both on campus and off. So you probably heard of CPT and OPT from your, from your student uh, as they're looking forward to their plans for their education and their employment beyond. Um, we also offer workshops, information, referral to referrals on cultural and personal matters. And I think most importantly, it goes a little overlooked sometimes, but we are um, a very important part of what we do is that we are the primary point of contact on campus for all of the international students. And you've seen tonight that there's a lot going on on campus. UC Santa Cruz is a really big place with a lot to offer. And you might not even know all of the things that there are to offer there. If your student is having trouble with, um, with adjustment, with language, with um, emotional, some emotional concerns, um, or with making friends, or with finding something to do when they're not in class. There are resources for all of these things. And, and it's important that the students know how to access them. We know how to access them. There's an expert for everything all across campus. And we've got a lot of friends across campus, and we know where to direct your students. So that's one of the very um, essential functions of the ISSS office as well. So um, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to take up too much of, of your time. I do hope that the next time I get to speak with you, which quite possibly might be at graduation, um, that it will be in person. And I want to welcome you and your family to UC Santa Cruz. And I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we are hoping that when families are able to bring their students in person that we'll have a round two of orientation so that we can meet people at that time. Um, so we'll see how quickly that happens. But, uh, any questions for Frank and team, please put those in the Q&A. And we're getting towards the end here. Now it's time for general questions and answers. Anything that you're wondering about that we didn't cover, or anything you didn't understand that we did try to cover, please drop that in the Q&A. And we will wait to see if there are any questions. Andy, do you want to put the music back on while we're waiting? Is that possible? <laughs> Thank you, families. We'll stay a few more minutes in case there are questions, but if you have no questions, you're welcome to sign out. Thank you so much for coming tonight or this morning. Ah, Victoria, I forgot your slide. This is our contact information. Victoria is going to tell us how to contact us. Okay, yes. So this is how you can contact us in general for a global engagement. That's us at Global Programming and ISSS. So even though we are not, we are not having our in-person office, we still hold online office hours. Um, our office hours are nine o'clock to 12 noon, and then again at one o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. Again, Santa Cruz time zone. We can be contacted by email at global at ucsc.edu or also by phone 831-459-2858. And they'll be answered by our lovely office manager, Lena Lee. And again, while we, while we are not able to meet in person, when we finally can be in person, um, our front office is located in what is known as the classroom unit building. That's the actual name of the building that our office lives in, in room 103. And the 1156 High Street is the general address for the entire campus.